uh, been a long time since I've been to Moundsville. Uh, I believe it's been about five years. Heather and I have been a lot of places, uh, seen a lot of things, but it's good to get back to, to, uh, to where I started uh, my preaching career. It's good to see familiar faces uh, in the audience, people that helped me get where I am today. I can definitely say I would not be uh, the preacher that I am today without the School of Preaching. Uh, everything I've learned uh, and everything that I know about the Bible uh, a great deal of it has come from the school and from the great teachers that we had there. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate uh, the good work that you guys do here in Moundsville. And I hope you continue that. And I hope the Lord blesses you a great deal um, in your continued work. I have to be honest, when Denver called me, I got a little bit of a late notice uh, about speaking on the lecture. And he called and asked me if I would. And I was immediately honored and very excited about the opportunity to come and to speak on this lectureship, something I've always really wanted to do. Uh, and then before I said yes, though, I had to ask him, you know, what is my assignment? Uh, and he said, we're doing the Minor Prophets, and you're going to be speaking out of the book of Zephaniah, and your subject is God's judgment on Jerusalem's gods. And I had to be honest with you, I hesitated for just a moment uh, before I gave an answer, because it had been a while since I'd uh, studied the book of Zephaniah. I mean, I'd casually read it uh, every year in our daily Bible readers club there uh, in North Beckley, but it had been a long, long time since I had done a serious study uh, of the book of Zephaniah, and so I wasn't quite sure I wanted to jump uh, into this uh, quite so fast. So I thought about it for a while, I prayed about it for a while, and I decided, you know what, it'll be good for me to go back and study a section of Scripture that I hadn't spent a lot of time with. Uh, and it has been. It has been a blessing. Even though Zephaniah is not an easy book to read, it's not a book that I would decide to read if I were going to, uh, to read a passage of Scripture before turning in for the night. It's, it's, it's a very dark book. Uh, he presents a prophecy of doom. Uh, and so unless you like nightmares, it's not a book that I would read before turning in uh, for the night. Why is Zephaniah so, so hard for, to read? I have to be honest with you, I started asking members of the congregation there in North Beckley uh, what they knew about the book of Zephaniah. And I was surprised to know that they didn't know anything about it. Most of them couldn't even locate it uh, in the Bible. They knew it was a minor prophet. They knew it was one of the smaller books. But they hadn't spent a long time with it. They hadn't read it, and most of them who had read it said they'd read it very quickly because they didn't want to spend a lot of time there. Zephaniah proclaims a dark day of destruction. He talks a great deal about the day of the Lord. He calls it the great day of the Lord, the day of the wrath of the Lord, the day of the anger of the Lord. And it was a dreadful day. It was a terribly dreadful day. Turn to Zephaniah. I encourage you to take your Bibles. We're going to cover a lot of Scripture. We're going to be in Zephaniah. We're going to go back in Hebrew history. We're going to cover a lot of ground, a lot of Scripture, read lengthy passages. And I want you to be able to follow along with me. But look at Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 14 through 17. Listen to what he says about this great day of the Lord. He says, The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day. A day of distress and anguish. A day of ruin and devastation. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. A day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty embattlements. I will bring distress on mankind so that they will walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Not a very positive message. But it is a message that is desperately, I believe, needed in our society today. Zephaniah is still as applicable and practical as it was in his day. People need to hear the message of Zephaniah. It is a harsh book. George Adam Smith, in his commentary, said this about the tone of Zephaniah's prophecy. He said, no hotter book lies in the Old Testament. Neither dew, nor grass, nor tree, nor any blossom lives in it. But everywhere is fire, smoke, and darkness. Drifting chaff, ruins, needles, salt pits, with owls and ravens looking from the windows of desolate places. Zephaniah delivers a strong and a very serious message to God's people and to the world. It is a message that needs to be heard. It is a message that needs to be heeded by all. The message is simply this. God will not tolerate sin. 
Specifically, he will not tolerate idolatry. The message is simple. You must repent or you will perish. But as you're going to see, as we continue to study the book of Zephaniah, God's does not desire is not destruction. Not at all. God's desire is that of deliverance. Look at chapter 2 and verse 3. God calls out to the people. He begs them, seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, who do his just commandments. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. In chapter 3, in verse 17, he said, The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. God's motive is the saving of his people. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants all to come to repentance. Zephaniah's book is not easy to read, not any stretch of the imagination. It's a dark and gloomy book, but it is one that we must search. It is one that we must understand. To understand Zephaniah, we need to know a little bit about the historical context of his writings. King Hezekiah was followed on the throne by his 12-year-old son, son Manasseh. Manasseh was, without doubt, the most unrighteous ruler in Judah's history. He did his level best to destroy all the good that his father had done. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 21. I want to read verses 1 through 9. It gives us a history, just a synopsis of everything that Manasseh did uh, to destroy his father's work and to destroy the kingdom of God. The Bible says, And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the despicable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places that Hezekiah his father had destroyed, and he erected altars for Baal and made an astra as Ahab king of Israel had done, and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. And he built altars for the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he burned his son as an offering, and used fortune-telling, omens, and dealt with mediums and with wizards. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. And the carved image of the Astra he had made, he said in the house of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. And I will not cause the feet of Israel to wander any more out of the land that I gave to their fathers, if only they will be careful to do according to all that I have commanded them and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. But they did not listen. And Manasseh led them astray to do more evil than the nations had done whom the Lord destroyed before the people of Israel. Manasseh was an unrighteous ruler. He was succeeded by his son Ammon, who followed his father's wicked footsteps. Uh, Hester, in his book, The Heart of Hebrew History, said, Ammon, whose name was that of an Egyptian god, was 22 years old when he became king. His policy was exactly that of his father Manasseh in the beginning of his reign. He went to work to undo the last reforms of his aged father and went to excess in his enthusiastic advocacy of idolatry. His behavior was so disgraceful that his own servants slew him in the second year of his reign. An evil man. A terribly evil man. During the reigns of both Manasseh and Ammon, Judah sank to astounding moral and spiritual debts. In the year 640 B.C., at the age of 24, King Ammon was assassinated by his own servants, and his eight-year son Josiah was made king. At the age of 16, Josiah began his historical reform. Turn to 2 Chronicles. I want to read chapter 34. We're going to read verses 1 through 7 together. 2 Kings chapter 34. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. And he did that was right in the eyes of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father. And he did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet a boy, he began to seek the God of David his father. 
And in his twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the ashram, and the carved, and the metal images. And they chopped down the altars of the Baals in his presence. And he cut down the incense altars that stood above them. And he drove, or he broke in pieces, the ashram, and the carved and metal images. And he made dust of them and scattered it over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He also burned the bones of the priests on their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And in the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon, and as far as Naphtali, in their ruins all around, he broke down the altars and beat the ashram and the images into powder and cut down all the incense altars throughout all the land of Israel. Then he returned to Jerusalem. Josiah's reforms were the most extensive of any that were ever attempted by any king to ever rule in Judah. In the process of cleansing the temple, Hilkiah the priest discovered the lost book of the law of Moses. And that is a very sad story for me. Uh, The fact that the Bible, the word of God, had been lost. That it hadn't been read, hadn't been heard, it hadn't been preached, and who knows how long. And someone has said, the Bible had been left on the shelf for so long and ignored that no one could even remember where it was or even care. Friends, it saddens me, it truly does. We seem to be living in an age where Bible knowledge is less and less. Even in our churches. People don't know the Word of God. I was teaching, filling in for one of our elders. He was on a business trip and he was teaching the teenage class this last quarter. And he asked me just to fill in to teach him whatever I I decided to teach. And I debated what to dive into. And I decided, you know what, we'd have a lesson on Christian dating. So going to the class, and I decided to have a little competition with the students and uh, really just kind of mess with their minds a little bit. I enjoyed that type of thing. And so I said to them, I want you to take a Bible, and I want you to, uh, to, to find a story for me. And we're going to see who can find it the quickest. And they started to whine and complain. They didn't like the idea. And I said, I'll give you a hint. I want you to look in the Gospels. And I said, all right. Some of them asked me where the Gospels were, and I helped them find the Gospels. And I said, I want you to find, remember, I'm teaching on the subject of dating. I said, I want you to find for me the very first story of Jesus' very first date. Now, you know what I thought would happen? I thought they would call my bluff. I figured they would see exactly what I was doing. I figured they would know that no such story exists in the gospel. You know what they all did? It started in Matthew, and they started leafing through. One of them said, was it Mary? No, it wasn't Mary. Around Christmas time, a few years ago, I was walking through the halls of our church, and one of the teachers stopped me, and she had this disturbed look on her face. I said, what's wrong? She said, I'm teaching these kids, and we're teaching the virgin birth, and we're talking about the birth of Christ. And I turned to the class of, I think it was third and fifth graders, and I said, tell me the name of Jesus' mother. Blank look over their faces. I had no idea. Our children aren't being taught the Bible. The reason is because the parents don't know the Bible. Again, I got up to preach one Sunday morning, and I was preaching on the subject of patience. And I said at the beginning of my lesson, you've heard the cliche, patience is a virtue. And I said, where in the Bible is that found? People began to scratch their heads. People began to look and wonder, where is it? I said, when you go home, turn to the Old Testament and read the book of Hezekiah, and you will find it. No one caught. What I was saying. No one, not even afterwards, that they even realized that there is no such book of Hezekiah. No one knows the stories of the Bible, the simple stories, the stories that I learned as a child. We remodeled our auditorium at North Beckley. We put new lights in, new walls, and when we were done, it was time to decorate, put everything back up on the walls. I decided I was going to move the clock. Because I had a tendency for people to turn and look at the clock while I was preaching. It was on the, to the left here on the wall. So I decided I was going to put it where you guys have. I was going to put it in the back of the auditorium over the doorway. And I got up. And everybody, several people that morning had mentioned to me, where's the clock? Before I even got to the pulpit, where's the clock? I said, you'll find it. Don't worry, it's there. So I got up. And I said, if you have the urge to look at the clock during my sermon, remember two things. One, I'll see you do it now because you have to look over your shoulder. And two, remember Lot's wife. (laughs) Again, again, very few people 
knew what I was even talking about. There is a plague of Bible illiteracy in our nation and in our churches. It's a sad story that people don't know the Word of God. They didn't know it in Zephaniah's day. When Josiah realized what had been found, he assembled all the people of Judah, from the greatest to the least, and he read the book of the covenant to them. 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verses 29 and 30. The temple was cleansed and the Passover was observed like it had never been observed before. There's a great amount of debate as to exactly when, during Josiah's reign, Zephaniah prophesied. Did he preach before, in the middle, or at the end of Josiah's Reformation? Well, I believe that Josiah, or that Zephaniah presented his message before Josiah's Reformation. And I, he probably had a great deal to do with the initiation of those reformations. I believe that for two primary reasons. First of all, if the reforms had already taken place or were currently underway, it seems only reasonable to me that Zephaniah would have mentioned them. That he would have talked about the great king and what he was doing in the land of Judah. Yet there's not even a single mention or hint of Josiah's work. Secondly, it seems clear from reading the book in its entirety that idolatry was extremely rampant. rampant. From the language that Zephaniah uh, used, it doesn't sound as if any of the reforms had taken place. It sounds as if the place of the ashram, the carved and metal images, and the altars of Baal were very much a part of Judah's religious worship of that day. It doesn't sound like any of the reforms had taken place. That's the historical context of Zephaniah's story. We come to the text. We're going to study verses 2 through 6 in depth this morning. I want to read verses 2 and 3 together. If you'll turn to Zephaniah chapter 1. Zephaniah says, I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away man and beast, and I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. Zephaniah begins with a series of statements starting with the phrases, I will, I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens. I will cut off mankind. His prophecy is one of absolute and complete destruction. He is going to consume all things. The Lord declares that he's going to destroy everything. Earth, birds, beasts, mankind. And of course that reminds us of Genesis. When God decided that he was going to destroy the world with a flood because the wickedness of man was so great. In Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 7, we read, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. Zephaniah's inclusion of the creation is interpreted in various ways. Some think, people think he's just being figurative. He's not really going to destroy the earth. He's not really going to destroy man to beast. To some people that sounds extreme. Man is the one that has sinned. Man is the one that has transgressed the law of God. Why would he include creation? Why would he include nature? Why would he include the animals? Well, I believe Homer Haley was right when he said, this all-embracing declaration is not to be explained away by simply away simply as a hyperbole, for other prophets had shown that the animal creation is affected by man's sin. The entire creation suffered from the effects of man's sin. The Apostle Paul confirms as much. In Romans chapter 8, verses 20 through 23, the Apostle Paul said, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, and hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we await eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. 
believe David Lipscomb had a very good quote, a commentary on this passage of Scripture and his commentary on Romans. He said, as a result of Adam's sin, the whole creation was cursed and fell away from its original design and become subject to the reign of death. The hope is entertained that when the deliverance comes to the children of God and when they are delivered from the bondage of corruption and from the present house of the grave, then the whole creation will share this deliverance and be freed from the corruption and mortality to which it has been subjected by the sin of man. It shared the corruption and mortality of man's sin and will share his deliverance from it. Our sin went far beyond affecting just us. People like to believe that sin is just committed in a bubble. That what I do doesn't affect anybody but just me. It doesn't affect my family. It doesn't affect my friends. It doesn't affect society or my nation or the world at large. It doesn't have any effect on creation whatsoever. But our sin has large roots and long fingers. And it is extremely far-reaching. Man's wickedness was so pervasive that God deemed the destruction of all things absolutely necessary. And it is amazing the depths to which man's sins reach, especially that of idolatry. It amazes me that man is willing to bow down to the creature rather than to the creator. Man seems determined to worship anything or anyone other than God. And it has always been that way. Always. Listen to what Paul said in Romans 1. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they came futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were dark, darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. We think idolatry is dead today. We think it's something that doesn't apply to our time and to our culture. Nothing can be further from the truth. Idolatry is still very much alive today. And it is still as foolish as it was in Zephaniah's day and in Jeremiah's day. Listen to Jeremiah. He commented on the ridiculous idea of serving an idol. He said in Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 2 and 5, Thus says the Lord, Learn not the way of the nations, nor be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, because the nations are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vanity. A tree from the forest is cut down and worked with an axe by the hands of a craftsman. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with hammer and nails so they cannot move. Their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field. They cannot speak. They have to be carried, for they cannot walk. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither is it in them to do good. He went on to say, in chapter 10, verses 14 and 15, Every man is stupid and without knowledge. Every goldsmith is put to shame by his idols, for his images are false, and there is no breath in them. They are worthless, a work of delusion at the time of their punishment. They will perish. When we think about these idol worshippers, we think about exactly what they're doing. It's absurd. They go out and they cut down a tree and they decorate it with gold and silver. They bow down and they begin to pray to it. And we shake our heads in disbelief. And we say, how could they possibly be so foolish? How can we be so foolish? We don't worship the same type of idols that they worship. We don't go out in our backyards and cut down a tree or grab a rock and a chisel and, and chisel out some image and bow down to it and believe that it is our God. No, our idols live in our hearts. They're just as real, and they're just offensive to God as the idols that they had in Zephaniah's day. We have different type of idols. If you don't believe me, look at the state of our economy. It's a clear indication that we serve an idol. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5, Paul said, covetous is idolatry. There are a lot of factors that go into our economic state right now. A lot of blame can be laid on both sides of the aisle in Washington. But I believe the underlining cause is simply this. It's greed. On every part of society, those on Wall Street and those on Main Street are just as guilty of serving the idol of greed 
We just don't have enough, we believe. We have to have more. Idolatry is still alive today. It comes in the form of money. It comes in the form of entertainment. It comes in the form of our jobs. People giving time, all of their time to their careers. Climbing the corporate ladder. Giving no time whatsoever to God and to His kingdom. Are they concerned about bigger house, bigger car, bigger boat? More comfort. I say it in the sports world. I'm hesitant to tell people this, but I am a Mountaineer fan. Not that I'm a Mountaineer fan. That's not what I'm hesitant to tell you. I'm proud of that. I love the Mountaineers. Follow them through and through. Take blood. It's blue and gold. Guaranteed. Heather and I are privileged to have season tickets to the Mountaineers for the last couple of years, and we go to every game. Matter of fact, I was at the game Thursday night. And we came from Morgantown to, to Moundsville, and we've been here ever since. But it amazes me the level at which people can allow those type of things to consume their lives. I mean, I love them, and I follow them, and I read about them, and I go to their games, and I do all of that. But since the Mountaineers have been struggling just a little bit this year, haven't been what people were hoping they would be, and I think they're foolish to have the expectations that they had at the beginning of the year, but that's neither here nor there, and that's a different debate for a different time. But... People boggle my mind when it comes to how they worship sports figures and sports teams today. I was online after the Mountaineers lost their second game, and I was reading some of the blogs. And I was just kind of trying to figure out what the, you know, the, the feelings of the fans were. And one of these guys said, you know what? Your expectations are too high. You're expecting too much. A lot of players were gone. We have a new coaching staff. Things are different. It's just a game, one blogger said. Somebody signed on and said, it's not just a game, it's my life. I stepped back and said, whoa, I love the Mountaineers just as much as anybody. But your life? They live for Saturday. They live for the next game. It's like drugs to them. They get a high on it. And their lives are simply consumed by it. You think I'm being silly? I'm not. Go to some of these games. You'll see these people. They're crazy. They are. They're nuts. Idolatry is alive and well today, just as it was in Zephaniah's day. And God will consume the idols of our hearts just like he consumed the idols on the high places in Zephaniah's day. It's going to happen. God declares the consumption of all things in the first couple of verses. Let's read verses 4 through 6. Zephaniah continues, I will stretch up my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal in the name of the idolatrous priests along with their priests, those who bow down on the roofs to the host of heavens, those who bow down and swear to the Lord and yet swell by Milcom, those who have turned back from following the Lord, who do not seek the Lord or inquire of Him. Zephaniah zeroes in specifically on the idols of Judah and Jerusalem and he pronounces their utter destruction and he starts with Baal. Zephaniah declares that God is going to utterly destroy from Jerusalem the remnant of Baal. And some have concluded that this reverence to the remnant suggests that the reforms of Josiah had already taken place and that Josiah had been successful in purging Judah from the worship of Baal. I don't believe what he's talking about. I don't believe he's saying there's only a remnant left that I need to wipe out. I believe that what Zephaniah is saying is that God is going to totally exterminate the worship of Baal. That when he's done with these idolaters, there won't even be a remnant of Baal left in the land. I believe what he's talking about. And it was successful. When Judah was taken into Babylonian captivity, Baal worship was completely destroyed. He completely purged any remnant in Judah. Not only will God annihilate Baal worship, but he's going to cut off the names of the idolatrous priest along with the priest. It's sad. I believe, honestly, it's sad that the highest and most holy office in Zephaniah's time had been corrupted. We have the priest who compromised and made some type of pact or deal with the worshipers and priests of Baal. Friends, we have to take seriously our job as ministers of the Word of God. You've heard the, the phrase, like father, like son. I believe in Zephaniah's day, you could have said, like priest, like people. 
the priests led the spiritual welfare of the nation of Judah. What the priests did, the people were going to do because the people had placed their trust in these men. They believed them to be selected by God. They believed them to be the spiritual leaders of the time. And so the people followed them wherever they went. That lays a grave responsibility on me. Knowing that when I get up and preach the word of God, and that the way that I live is going to lead the people. Like minister, like members. That's just the way it's going to be. And I don't think we can overemphasize what Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy Chapter 4 and verse 16, he says, Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist this in this, for by doing so you will save both yourself and your hearers. I believe if you have a screensaver on your computer, a little marquee that can roll across a phrase, that ought to be it. We ought to persist in the teaching of the Word of God. Over the last several years, I have heard repeatedly over and over again about preachers who have given themselves into immorality, who have fallen into temptation, various types. And every time that I hear it, the congregation suffers. It dwindles or even dies. The priests were the leaders of the people, and they were willing to follow them wherever they went. God says he's going to cut them off. He's going to cut off the priests, He also condemned those who bow down on the roofs to the host of heavens. The reference to the roofs, I think, indicate that the worship of idols had become a family affair. That it was common in that day, not only for the priests to involve themselves in idolatry worship, but it had become so pervasive that every family was doing, uh, was engaged in idolatrous worship. Look at uh, Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 18. Jeremiah said, The children gather wood. The father kindle fire, and the women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven, and they pour out drink offerings to other gods to provoke me to anger. Everybody's involved. Mom and dad, boys and girls, everybody was involved in this idolatrous worship. Jeremiah seems to imply that the idolatrous worship was almost universal, as if worship of the heavenly bodies had profaned every rooftop in Judah. Look at Jeremiah. Chapter 19, verse 13, the houses of Jerusalem and the houses of the kings of Judah, all the houses on whose roofs offerings have been offered to all the host of heaven, the drink offerings, they have been poured out to other gods. It was common practice. And that's why I believe parenting, even more now that I'm a parent, is such a huge role in society. It is. It is. I can't can't emphasize how important it is for our parents to understand that they are leading their children every day of their lives. It amazes me. It does. It really amazes me how fast children learn. It does. They pick up so quickly. They observe everything you do. Elijah. Can't go to a sermon without mentioning Elijah. Elijah follows me around. He does everything that I do. He watches everything that I do. I don't get a moment's peace. Since he's been born, everywhere I turn, Elijah's watching me. He watches his mommy. Everything mommy does, Elijah wants to do. He got a dishwasher. Mommy fills the dishwasher. What's Elijah do now? Elijah knows how to open the dishwasher and take the dishes out. He doesn't put them away. He drops them on the floor, and we have to wash them again. But that's beside the point. The point is, it's a simple illustration, but the point is simply this. He watches everything. If he picks up on something as little as that, as loading a dishwasher, he's only a year old, and he's already picked up on something as small as that. You think he picks up on other, the other, my other behaviors? My spiritual life? My prayer life? My worship habits? Sure he does. He watches everything that happens. He's the nosiest little fellow you've ever, watched, ever seen. In worship, he doesn't sleep a moment, except when daddy's preaching, then he sleeps. But other than that, he watches everything that happens. He listens to the song leaders. He watches communion being passed. Friends, we have, as parents, a great responsibility and a wonderful influence over our children. We need to use it to the glory of God. To raise our children up to honor and live for Him. 
He goes on. He says that these people have worshipped Milcom, who was the chief deity of the Ammonites. And he condemns them. And he says also, he condemns those who have turned their back from following the Lord, who do not seek the Lord or inquire of Him. It sounds to me that he is condemning the sin of indifference, for one. I believe that indifference is probably the biggest enemy of the church today. People simply don't care anymore. They're too involved in life. They're too wrapped up in the affairs of this world. And they simply no longer give their attention to God. He says there that these people, Zephaniah says they were trying to to swear by the Lord and by Milcom. They had divided their loyalties. They were trying to serve two gods. Can't be done. It's utterly impossible. Jesus said in the great Sermon on the Mount, if you turn to Matthew chapter 6, very quickly because I'm running out of time. Jesus said in verse 24, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. There are other proverbs that teach the exact same lesson. Someone said, Lay not two saddles on one horse. I like that one. Another one said, A true subject serves not two sovereigns. That's another good one. Another one said, You cannot go east and west at the same time. Can't be done. You cannot serve the world and God at the same time. It's absolutely impossible. And the end result, the end result is defeat and disgrace. Friends, we serve a God that is a jealous God. He hates idolatry. He will not tolerate it among His people or by the world. Zephaniah has clearly declared that God will judge those who divide their loyalties or abandon the one true God. Heaven help us to always seek the Lord and always inquire of Him. Because He's our only hope. He's our only hope. And we have to place our complete and utter trust in Him.